Today, I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ. I just chose Jesus. I have discovered that my God is mighty to save the whosoevers from whatsoever, even to the uttermost. When I was only four years old, I was sexually molested. Before I was even conscious, I had rejected my father as my gender role model. I was so afraid of my father that I would actually hide from him. And when he was home, he was so abusive that I rejected his masculinity completely. Rejection for me came at birth from a woman, my mother. My mother was adamant that she was going to have a baby girl. She had no desire for a boy whatsoever. And before I was two years old, she had broken my arm in two different places on two different occasions. Satan's first lie to me was that I was unwanted. And then it would be up to Jesus Christ to prove to me that that simply is not true. We're hungry for love. We want to be held. We want to belong. My whole life, I've wanted to experience love. I want to belong. Throughout this weekend, Let's consider what can happen when we respond to the love of Jesus. Don't take my word for it. I'm inviting you to experience God and take him at his word. Develop intimacy with him. I'm not here to ask you to be like me. <laughs> I'm here to share what's available for any of us through Jesus. I want to tell you that you matter, that you belong, that you are loved. I learned the hard way that the love of Jesus is what matters most, not the love I thought I deserved. My natural mother carried me during those nine months and was around relatives. And most of my relatives asked her, so do you think you'll have a boy or a girl? Oh, I'm having a girl, there's no doubt about it. She was adamant. And yet, in those days, there was no amniocentesis, there was no ultrasound. And guess what? Her strongest desires could not force my gender. And so what happened? When I was born, I was rejected. I was alienated. I was discarded. We lived on an Air Force base. My father was an Air Force career man. The neighbors had told him that they thought I was suffering physical abuse, but he was gone on assignment all the time and he thought they were just being nosy neighbors. Until the day he came home and found my arm in a sling and asked what had happened, you just heard. And so he reached out to a brother and three sisters in San Diego who were married and my aunts and uncles, and asked if they would get involved and maybe take care of me for a bit. They passed me around in between those three sets of aunts and uncles, only to realize that with each one of them, with each woman in each family, I gave her a nervous breakdown. Is it any wonder that I didn't run Craving love from a woman? So they thought, well, maybe it was just a phase his natural mother was going through, so let's return it, him to her and see how it goes. Within 30 days, the state intervened and said, 
either remove him from the home or we will. And so my natural father reached out again to his brother and sisters and said, is there somebody that can help me with this? My Aunt Virginia and my Uncle Fred said, well, that's interesting that you ask because we've been praying rather diligently about this and we'd like to propose to you that we would take Wayne on one condition, that you let us adopt him permanently because we don't want to see him passed around anymore. They didn't know what they were getting into. Before I was three years old, I was running around the house screaming, I don't want to be a boy, I want to be a girl. And I was dressed as a girl when I did this. I'd like to read you a quote from author C.S. Lewis. There's no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch Every split second is claimed by God and then counterclaimed by Satan. Satan claimed the love that belonged to me even before I was born. Satan wastes no time waging war to claim our souls. Because of our fallen nature, Sin is natural to us. It's Jesus and holiness that's unnatural. Because of our fallen state, we begin to respond to temptation just like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Do you have feelings sometimes that you know aren't pleasing to God, but for some reason they seem pleasing to you? You see, we all have junk. We're in this battle together. We have a cross to bear. God wants us to, or, or God wants to get all up in our business. <laughs> but a lot of us call on him when we think we're desperate. Guess what? We're desperate all the time. As I reflect about Jesus and his love for me today, I'm thankful for this verse from Jeremiah 1.5. I knew you before you were born, and you were set aside for my holy purpose. There are three points that I would like you to consider this evening about life, love, Temptation and scripture. Because of the rejection I experienced at birth, I didn't feel loved, so I began searching for love. I was raised in a Christian home with strong Christian parents. I was given the Bible to read, and guess what I read? Things about homosexuality. my heart began to identify, and I said, oh no, I didn't choose this. How could this, how could the word of God be describing me? What's wrong? In all the years I was in the church, it confirmed that homosexual behavior is sin. And that's where it stopped. It went dead silent. The church seemed clueless about how to help or guide me. This is still the case today in many of our churches and schools. This is the reason why some of you are sitting here today. Today the public sector is actually beginning to teach and promote, promote homosexuality as an option. My feelings of temptation, not truth, began to win me over as a teenager. Nothing 
absolutely nothing in God's word provides for any kind of homosexual relationship, monogamous or otherwise. So what do we do with our very real and often, often painful feelings? You just heard the description of how some people can arrive, how I think I arrived. Feelings that don't agree with the word of God. As a church, we don't have a very good track record about helping people deal with their sin temptations. Not just same-sex temptations, but a host of other temptations. Remember, as I pointed out, we all have our own junk. There are some today that don't see me as an advocate for gays. If that were true, I would not be standing here. You see, I happen to know that every soul is welcome at the foot of the cross. We've been guilty of ignoring many people as though they don't exist or as though we're part of some exclusive sainthood. But praise God. Because of events like this, I think that's beginning to change. Jesus' love is being revealed through the members of God's family. The world, it's drastically changing. The enemy is not hiding the fact that it belongs to him. So I propose to each of you, regardless of what you personally struggle with, regardless of what cherished sin you might have, it's decision time. We have a choice. Jesus or self. His will or my will. You know, it's usually the sin that we're most unfamiliar with that gets the crown. And in most cases, that's the sin of homosexuality. We've been in the habit of thinking that people have to lose their spots before they come through the church doors. I want to ask you a question this evening. Do you have a stone in your hand? I'd like you to consider James 5.16 where it tells us to come together and confess our sins one to another and pray for each other. Let's become a community of believers pointing to Jesus. Let's put our stones down. I'd like you to consider the story of Mary Magdalene. You see, I think it went something like this. Jesus sees Mary one day and says, Oh, Mary, what a beautiful woman you are. I'm going to be speaking today, and, and so maybe you'd like to come and hang out with me and, and have a meal with me, and maybe we could drink something together and, and just spend the day with me. And so Mary does, and she has a great day with Jesus, and at the end of the day, Jesus says, Mary, don't, don't go back to those men. They don't love you. And Mary says, yeah, they do. They're my people. Yeah, I love them. They love me. We have a good time. It's awesome. And she leaves. And the next day, she comes back. And Jesus says, Mary, so good to see you again. Come hang out with me. I'm going to do some more talking today. We'll share a meal together. We'll drink something together. We'll hang out. And so she does, and she spends the entire day. And then again in the evening, Jesus says, Mary, don't, don't go back to those, those men. They only want to abuse you. And she says, no, they love me. And then things begin to shift. 
she comes back again and again. And suddenly, not because Jesus was using clobber techniques, because he didn't, but because she saw the pure love of Jesus Christ, she recognized this love was definitely abuse. This love was based on her temptations. And now she has a desire for the purity and the love of Jesus Christ. So many people today are relying on their flesh instead of the word of God. It reminds me of a strong warning that comes in Isaiah 5.20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet, for bitter. I want to invite you to keep holding up Jesus. Put down the stones. Go and sin no more. Only love, the pure love of Jesus, can heal a broken heart. His promise to us is that the truth will set us free. We don't have to compromise the truth. We can love with the love of Jesus Christ. Yeah, it took me a long time. I tried a lot of roads. I tried a lot of people. I didn't find that love. One day, four years ago, I sat in my bedroom contemplating the fact that every single one of my gay friends are dead. That's 40 close friends and over 100 acquaintances. And I sat there in the best of health, HIV negative. And I heard this small voice say, Wayne, can you hear me now? There I was, alone with God. And I had a lightning bolt experience. Because God said to me, you know, Wayne, I love you, but you know what? It's not all about you. It's about me. Do you know me? I really didn't. I hadn't explored God's word. I hadn't spent good quality time in prayer, praying for the right things. You see, if you pray, please God make me straight, how do you know that that's what God wants for you? Maybe you're begging for something God doesn't want to give to you, but what he wants to give to you is an intimacy with him, not a sexual identity. Maybe that's a gift for some later on. Maybe not. But why don't I seek to do God's will instead of putting myself before God and saying what it is that I need to have? In this moment, God said, abide in me. And I came to find out that abide means spending every moment of every day with God and relying upon his scripture. Scripture has become my anchor. It's his word. It's his promises to me. There is comfort in Jesus and his truth. God doesn't change. In fact, he tells us, I am the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. 
God's not shifty on me. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, which you just heard, he confirms the kinds of sinners who won't be in heaven, who hang on to their sin, and then provides us with the promise of healing by telling us, such were some of you, but you were washed by the blood of the Lamb. And then he follows up in Revelations 12, 11, where he tells me that we overcome him, the enemy, the prince of darkness, by the word of our testimony. In James 5, 16, he tells us to come together and confess our sins to one another so that we can experience the healing that is promised. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, he tells me that when I repent, the past is forgotten, and now I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ. In John 15, 4, he tells me how I need to abide in Christ. In John 8, he tells me the truth will set me free. These are all beautiful, beautiful promises from God to me. There is so much precious counsel and promises that he's given us. But are we seeking him? Are we immersed in our fleshly feelings and believing the lies of the enemy? Oh, let me just share this part. <laughs> the walk back has not been easy. I've experienced skepticism, disbelief, resistance, Conflict. A certain amount of conflict may always be present. Conflict about our beliefs, conflict with the flesh. But we need to keep coming to the cross where there's forgiveness, grace, and most of all, his blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. People ask me today, so Wayne, are you tempted? And today my response is this. Are you? Of course I'm tempted, and likely will be until Jesus come. But the question is, what am I doing with my temptation? I was recently commenting in an online forum about same-sex attraction and the different viewpoints. And suddenly this girl pops up and says, oh, just get over yourself. At first I <clears throat> tried to analyze what prompted the comment. And then I thought to myself, she's right. It's about getting over myself. It's about self-denial. It's about bringing and submitting myself to Jesus Christ. I'm so grateful for her comment. Some of you might have seen this quote from Rick Warren currently floating around the internet. I'd like to share it with you. Our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. The second is that to love someone means you have to agree with everything they believe or do. Both are total and complete nonsense. You don't have to compromise convictions to be compassionate. This led me to contemplate what is real love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't boast. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. For me, coming to Jesus and experiencing his, his love means distancing myself from the loves of this world. Because of this, 
I found myself in need of a redeemer. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 and 57 says, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the challenge before us. The church is full of real people with sin in their lives. Do we throw them out and make it perfect? When someone falls, do we discourage them and disfellowship them? Or do we find out if they genuinely want to stop rebelling and bond with Christ? There's often this misconception that being Christian and doing God's will gives us a smooth ride. I like to remind folks that the streets of gold are in heaven, not on earth. There's a lot of rocky roads during our Christian walk. There are many who experience loneliness. What are you doing as sons and daughters of God? What are you doing to surround them in the way that Jesus would? I've recently experienced loneliness. But some have reached out, and I have been blessed to have developed friendships that are rewiring my same gendered relations in the way God intended. As members of his family, he asks us to participate in the healing process as friends and as mentors. Today, my focus is on God's plan for me in this politically charged environment where there is less and less regard for the word of God, we are challenged to uphold the importance of God's holy word and model ourselves after our creator. John 6, 37 reminds us that when we choose to come to Christ, no matter what our past or present situation, he draws us in. He accepts and welcomes us. I believe he calls us beyond our past and our present. I believe he calls us to a journey of faith and growth. Growth is often painful, yet rewarding. He asks us to live according to his good counsel. Throughout scripture, we find exhortations to choose leaders who will encourage that growth. So when selecting leaders in our local churches, I think we would want to choose those who are committed to the distinction of God's word for themselves and members. members. They would not be living openly in a way that contradicts the counsel of scripture, but would encourage others by their words and their examples to be true to the teachings of Christ. These teachings are found in scripture. It's where we find common ground as Christ followers. It is this that calls us beyond our human condition to focus on God's glorious and inspirational light. The word of God is our divine textbook that is worthy of our most intense study. And 2 Timothy 2.15 reminds us of such counsel, says, Study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. I don't have all the answers. <laughs> We're on a battlefield for our souls. All of us have sin in our lives. So, should we stop going to church? Or should we be kind to each other? Shouldn't we share our struggles and pray for one another and lift each other up? Let's be cautious and not embrace the devil's lies. Let's reach out to those who are not living as the creator designed, drawing them to know Jesus and honor him by walking in his righteousness, by faith. 
immersed in his grace. I invite you to spend this weekend listening to the life journeys of his redeemed and how they each responded to God and how his truth has set them free. Witness how God has preserved each of them for such a time as this. In closing, I would like to thank each of you and the church for listening to my story. Thank you for listening to my unique experience, my observations, my opinions, which testify to God's power to change lives. Because of his love, I turn the desires and temptations that I face each day over to him. I choose to live by his word rather than by my flesh. I'm inviting you to be gracious and encouraging to each other, to walk the straight and narrow way, because wide is the path that leads to destruction. I believe God preserved my life and is rewiring my soul and asking me to experience his everlasting love. This is not about changing sexual identity from gay to straight. This is about being drawn to the holiness of Jesus and allowing God's plan to be revealed in my life by surrendering my life to him each day. He's filling my life with solid friendships and a supportive church that is just now beginning to replace the loneliness I felt when I left the gay culture. I want to say thank you to those who have walked beside me. Many of you, many of you are seated here in this room this evening. You have witnessed my transition towards Christ and away from myself. You listened. You recognized that if the church and its believers are going to have any relevance, we've got to reflect God's love and help people identify the lies and the traps of Satan. By loving them and acquainting them with scripture and the power of prayer, we can be victorious. Our God, who loves us enough to give his life for us, has promised that he will never leave or forsake us. In our hearts, he has given us the power of choice. My prayer is that we won't break his heart by rejecting his truth and the freedom he won for us at the cross. Two people sit in this room tonight that prayed and trusted God for nearly 40 years, praying that he would show me his saving grace and teach me to cling to him. I would like to recognize my mother and my father, Fred and Virginia Blakely who have been married and trusted God for the last 70 years. I also wanted to recognize my sister who fell ill this evening, who also prayed for me over these 40 years and was with me in great times of darkness. And I would like to give them both one of God's most beautiful creations, the gift of flowers. My dad just turned 90 a couple of weeks ago, and mom turns 89 this month. <clears throat> I 
and I can't leave you without leaving some of God with you. And so would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I am so very blessed. Um, you hung on to me. You just knew at, at, at one point in my life you would be able to reveal yourself to me and that, that I would believe and that I would follow you. And that's all that you ask any of us to do is to just follow you. The road gets rocky sometimes. We have temptations. We have things that maybe we've done over and over in our lives, but you're waiting and you're patient for our decision. And you'll empower us to make the decision to do your will instead of our own. And so bless us, Lord, throughout this entire weekend. May you be heard through each and every speaker and may your Holy Spirit be present and touch and convict lives of what you want them to know between you and them. That is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. And thank you to the mom and dad who hung in there. <laughs> Some of us in this room are looking forward to the day when we're going to hear our own kids get up and give their testimony. And by the grace of God, we're going to see that day just as they saw this day. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, guys, I expect you back here bright and early in the morning. We're going to start at 9 o'clock. We're going to start at 8.55, but, you know, 9 o'clock. So make sure you're here. We're going to have Dr. Ball up right, you know, about 10 after. So I don't want you to miss anything that she has to share with you. So be sure and be here.